A penny for your thoughts. A penny for your thoughts. A penny for your thoughts. This phrase echoes in your head as you wait amongst the crowd. Stand in proud, dressed in your patriotic red, white and blue. You straighten your Wallace 72 badge. Wallace has finally finished the speech and is now shaking hands in the crowd. This is it. You push your way towards him, pulling the .38 revolver out of your pocket. You aim and fire again and again and again until click, click, empty. A force knocks you to the ground. Your head pounds. Your target lies on the ground, blood pooling under him. You did it, but it went so fast you forgot to say a penny for your thoughts. This was Arthur Bremer, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. Arthur Herman Bremer was born August 21, 1950 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His childhood was middle class in a dysfunctional home. Bremer would remark he would escape into the imaginary world with a happy family, no yelling, no hitting, and no abuse. He had no friends in school and was shunned everywhere. He graduated January 1969. He then did one semester in Milwaukee Area Technical College and dropped out. March 1969, he was a busboy at Milwaukee Athletic Club, but complaints came from customers that Bremer talked to himself, so he was put to the kitchen work, a sort of demotion in his eyes. This really annoyed Bremer, who lodged a complaint. It was looked at, but dismissed. Bremer would quit on February 16, 1972. While he worked as a busboy, he also worked part-time as a janitor in an elementary school. He would quit this job a month before quitting the busboy position in January 1972. October 16, 1971. After an argument with his parents, Bremer moved out, living in an apartment near Marquette University until May 1972. November 18, 1971, Bremer was out late and was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon while parked in a no parking zone. Bremer would be examined by a court appointed psychiatrist and he declared Bremer mentally ill. He said he was stable enough to live in the community and Bremer was released once his fine was paid of $39. On December 8th the same year, Bremer pled guilty to disorderly conduct. On January 13th, 1972, Bremer walked into a gun shop called the Casanova in Milwaukee and bought a .38 revolver. So March 1st, 1972, he's quit his jobs and ended a short relationship. This is when he started his assassin's diary. He gave his aim in it to assassinate Richard Nixon or George Wallace while attending a campaign rally specifically for the Wisconsin primary. The next evening, Bremer went to a meeting for Wallace at the Fister Hotel. Now his main target was the then President Nixon, but he did attend more of Wallace's events. April 3rd, he went to a victory rally for Wallace at the Holiday Inn. April 9th, he was taking a trip to Ottawa he took a gun with him, a browning 9mm, which he hid under a mat in the trunk of the car. But the gun dropped down into the wheel, wheel well and couldn't be reached. It would be found after Bremer's arrest while the car was being dismantled. April 10th, Bremer was at Ottawa, which Nixon was visiting. April 13th, Bremer went out in a business suit, sunglasses and a revolver to assassinate Nixon. But security was huge, so Bremer couldn't get close enough to Nixon to assassinate him, and so he abandoned the mission. He returned to Milwaukee, and after this, Bremer took a break from his assassin diary. But May 4th, 1972, Bremer set his targets now on Wallace. His diary entries didn't appear too happy with this decision, noting, quote, 
he, as in Wallace, certainly won't be buried with the sno snobs in Washington. I won't even rate on TV interruption in Russia or Europe when the news breaks. They have never heard of Wallace." End quote. The next day he went to Milwaukee Library, taking out two books about assassination of Robert Kennedy. Although he wasn't exactly excited about assassinating Wallace, Bremer still got up early on May 9th, 1972, took a car ferry to Lugington in Michigan to visit the Wallace campaign headquarters, where he offered to be a volunteer. That evening he attended a Wallace rally. Then two days later, he was at another rally for Wallace in Cadillac. He stayed overnight, uh, overnight at the Reed Hotel in Kalam Kalamazoo. Now on May 13th, the local police in Kalamazoo got a phone call from an unknown caller, letting them know about a suspicious person sitting in his car near the National Guard Armory. Police would find this odd person, who was Bremer. He explained to the police he was waiting for Wallace rally and wanted to be sure of a good seat. That evening, Bremer was at the rally, even photographed there. And at this rally, he had a clear shot of Wallace, but didn't take it. In his assassin's diary, he would say he didn't shoot because he might have shattered a glass, blinding some, quote, stupid 15-year-olds, end quote, who stood nearby or around Wallace. May 14th, Bremer headed to Maryland, entering his final diary entry. Bremer arrived at the Wheaton, Maryland, in Wheaton, Maryland for Wallace's appearance at Wheaton Plaza, a shopping centre rally, on May 15, 1972. This time he, won, he wore sunglasses and a patriotic colours of red, white and blue, along with a shiny new Wallace 72 campaign badge. At the rally, Bremer was Wallace's number one fan. He cheered and clapped while others heckled and taunted Wallace. Tomatoes were thrown at Wallace during this rally. They missed, but Wallace got the hint and decided not to do the usual after-speech handshaking. The opportunity Bremer was going to use to assassinate him. So a second rally was done in Laurel, Maryland. 1,000 people attended, including Bremer. This was more of a friendly crowd. After Wallace's speech, he went to do the shake, the hand, people's hands, something the Secret Service advised against. At about 4 p.m., Bremer pushed his way forward and opened fire with his .38 revolver, emptying it before he was subdued. Wallace was hit four times, fell backwards to the ground, and lay there bleeding out, losing a pint of blood before going into a mild state of shock. One of the bullets that hit Wallace lodged in the spinal cord. The others hit him in the abdomen and the chest. Three others at the rally were wounded. State Trooper Darthart, Dora Thompson and Nick Zavros, who was a Secret Service agent. Zavros was shot in the neck, which damaged his speech permanently. Bremer had a plan to yell out, quote, a penny for your thoughts, end quote, as he shot Wallace. But with all that went on, he forgot. The shooting also was caught on film by a TV cameraman. With the revolver empty, Bremer was tackled to the ground and was arrested. He was taken to hospital with a head wound. Later that night, he was arraigned and taken to Baltimore County Jail, where he was held for two months. The police searched Bremer's car, which they called a hotel on wheels. In the car, they found blankets, pillows, a semi-automatic pistol, binoculars, an umbrella, tape recorder, portable radio, electric shaver, photographic equipment, clothes, a toilet kit, a 1972 copy of Writer's Yearbook, and two library books. Seymour Hearst, a journalist, would write a widely noted article claiming secret tapes of Nixon sending a top aide named Howard Hunt to Milwaukee after the assassination in an attempt to plant campaign literature of Democratic George McGovern in Bremer's apartment. 
but Hearst said Hunt had to abandon as the FBI had already sealed Bremer's apartment. In 2007, the History News Network looked into these Nixon tapes and turned up nothing of what Hearst claimed. The tapes did show Nixon requesting presidential aide Charles Colson to spread rumours that Bremer was a supporter of McGovern and of the Kennedys. But there was no order from Nixon to have others enter Bremer's apartment to plant democratic materials. The trial began July 31st, 1972. Bremer's defence argued he was schizophrenic and legally insane when he did the shooting and had, quote, no emotional capacity to understand anything, end quote. The jury didn't buy it and rejected his argument. Prosecution said Bremer was indeed disturbed and yes, needed help, but knew exactly what he was doing, wanted the glory and was annoyed Wallace didn't die. The chief psychiatrist for the circuit court, Jonas Rappaport, spent nine hours with Bremer in June 1972. He said Bremer had schizophrenic personality disorder with paranoid and psychopathic features. But he would say that this didn't substantially impair his capacity to understand the criminality of his actions. August 4th, 1972, the jury reached a verdict within two hours. Bremer got 63 years in prison for shooting Wallace and three others. After an appeal, the sentence was knocked down to 53 years on September 28, 1972. He would appeal for further reductions, but this was rejected July 6th, 1973. What he did, his arrest and trial, indeed gave Bremer media attention. But like he predicted, soon he faded away and rarely remembered, not like Lee Harvey Oswald or John Wilkes Booth. In 1973, 113 pages of his diary was published. This portion was from April 4th, 1972 to the day before Bremer shot Wallace. August 26, 1980, an earlier part of the diary, March 1st to April 3rd, 1972, was found plastic wrapped in a suitcase at Milwaukee, 27th Street, Viaduct. In it, Bremer talked about wanting to kill Nixon and others who made him angry. He also discussed randomly opening fire at the corner of 3rd Street and Wisconsin Avenue. The diary is finally sold to an official of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, who then donated it to UAB's Reynolds Historical Library. The assassination attempt didn't end Wallace's career. He went on to be elected governor of Alabama twice, in 1974 and 1972. But from what happened, it did end his presidential hopes. From the assassination attempt, people were worried about Wallace's health, and he would never regain the momentum he had in 1972, before the shooting. In 1976, he entered the presidential election race, but dropped out because of lack of support. Wallace was forgiving towards Bremer, even writing to him in 1995 with hopes that one day the two could meet and get to know each other. Bremer is not known to have replied. George Wallace died September 13, 1998. Arthur Bremer served his sentence at Maryland Correctional Institution. October 6, 1972, he was in a fight and was placed in solitary confinement for 30 days. Another fight happened in December the same year. This time he was just reprimanded. But when he was in another fight in February 1973, he was again placed for 30 days in solitary confinement. In prison, he refused any mental health treatment and even refused evaluation. He worked in prison library and was described as compliant. His parents would visit him up until their deaths. Arthur Bremer was released November 9, 2007 aged 57, serving 35 
of the 53 years. As part of his release terms, he was to be ele uh, electronically monitored, stay away from electric, of electric officials and candidates, undergo mental health evaluation, and receive treatment if the state deems it necessary. He also cannot leave the state without written permission from the state agency that will supervise him until his probation is over in 2025. Today he lives in Cumberland, Maryland, and according to law officials, has a steady job and has stayed out of the limelight. Thank you all for listening. Next time I'll look at Mark Chapman, the man who murdered former Beagle John Lennon on December 8, 1980 in New York City. Chapman shot at Lennon five times, hitting him four times. Chapman remained at the scene, reading the catcher in the rye until he was arrested. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.